How's it going, handsome people? Welcome to Nadine Sports Bets and Fun. Uh, today I have a mini series of videos with some uh, training theory. This is going to be useful for athletes, for runners, for uh, people that don't have a formal coach, or you know, coaches that are parents that are helping in their high schools or with their kids in the coaching. Um, this is going to be a lot of information I found uh, through my uh, recent researching and training. Um, some courses I've been taking and some videos I found on the inter internet and they're going to start with theory and they are slowly going to uh, work itself out into planning and technique and drills and all that. So thank you to those channels like Brian Climbers. Check it out. It's a great channel. I'm going to link the link his site in the in the description great technique channel a uh, channel uh technique analysis uh jump science with uh that inspired me on the format that i would use to give these uh mini courses and uh coaches like dan path tom tellez you know uh ron Gregg, Raina ryder uh bushy schneider uh carol smith uh, Chris Corfis and all those that you should know and investigate so you can uh, improve your knowledge as a coach. So um, with uh, uh, no more uh, to say, let's get started and please enjoy the video. Hey guys, uh, welcome to Nadine Sports Pets and Fun. Today we have like a little mini class about what influences you to be fast right to be a good sprinter and to run at top speed um, I have to say that if, if you're an English speaker and you live in the States you would be better if you look for things that include uh, videos or work or um, literature from Dan Path, Boo Schneider, Ralph Mann, Mike Hurst, Carol Smith and all these great coaches that live in the States if you're an English speaker and are not from this, uh, the United States, please look for those channels, please look for that information. I also based my, um, my video today in their information, but also in two YouTube channels. This is Jump Science and Brian Climbers uh, channel, uh, channel, so check those out too. There will be a link in the description. Um, well, let's get started. What's the first thing you got to know? Physics. And physics are the... It's the science or the forces that influence every body in the planet. Nobody escapes physics. So the laws of, of physics in this planet are based on the laws of movement of Newton. So the first one is the law of inertia. Uh, the second one, second one is force equals mass times acceleration, in which every time there's a force, there's an acceleration. And if uh, acceleration or is zero, there is zero force. Um, the other, uh, the third law is opposite forces. This means that, well, I'm standing here, I have to produce a force in opposition to gravity on the planet so I can stand up. If I throw a ball, I'm putting as much force into the ball as the ball is putting into my hand. And uh, of course, the ball will get displaced because it weighs less, it has less mass. But if we had the same mass, we would oppose each other. So the, the other thing uh, that's important is that since if there's a question, to run at top speed and maintain a top speed, how much acceleration do you need? Well, the answer is zero. Because in top speed, there is no more acceleration. You reach the top, you cannot accelerate anymore but that means that there's, there's zero force what does that mean you don't produce force to run fast they always told me you, you gotta be uh, strong and produce a lot of force when you run fast. well I'm gonna explain that in a little bit after we analyze vectors but just keep that in the back of your head right uh, forces are uh, represented as vectors uh, vectors have a magnitude and a direction, so they're going some way and you can measure how big or great they are. Um, so let's say there's this vector. To simplify analysis, we're going to break it down into smaller vectors. This one has a vertical component and a horizontal component. Every time we see a 
vertical and a horizontal component, we can see they're perpendicular. Perpendicular forces and perpendicular vectors have no influence on each other. That's why we break them down like that. So, if we wanted to have a force on top of the force we already have, let's say in this place, its value would be zero because it's perpendicular to this force, right? Perpendicular forces have no influence on each other. So, keeping that in mind, so we had to make a, a little qu uh, cut because the, the dogs were barking. So, <laughs> I would say, what forces influence in the, in the race and in your speed? Well, what I hear a lot is uh, in modern times is air resistance. Oh, how aerodynamic is, is this vehicle? How aerodynamic is your airplane? And oh, I couldn't run uh, really fast because there was too much uh, wind, uh, too much headwind. And yes, it does influence your times a little bit, but if you can walk, you can break air resistance. Uh, so yeah, it will influence in your personal best mark, but it doesn't mean you cannot overcome this force. This is actually a very small force that's uh, um, happening against you. Now, the other one is, of course, propulsion. How much are you pushing yourself or creating force forward? And of course, propulsion has the vector that's pushing you horizontally, but if you see the position of my leg, there's another vector this way, right? So we have a vertical component too. The other force that's working pro and con is friction. You know, friction when you put your leg in front of you, you're creating a force back and back and up. And you already had this momentum going forward. So you're actually breaking. Ideally, this should be zero or next to zero because there's always have to be some time for you to um, uh, what's it called to balance yourself to uh, uh, to produce amortization in order to pr uh, propulse yourself forward so remember when I said that to run at top speed you need zero forces this means that propulsion at top speed should be equal or superior to the forces of the air resistance and a friction. But since this one's very small and this one should be close to zero, why is it that I cannot run a hundred miles an hour? Why cannot run as why can I not run as fast as a as a cheetah or a deer? Well that we will answer it after our cut. So in this two, we, I'm gonna play two images so you can see what I'm talking about uh, clearly. This is Usain Bolt in uh, warm-up. And um, you can see how stiff and extended his leg is uh, on ground contact when, when all his uh, body's align and his weight is on his heel right now. And this is part of what we are talking about. This is the, the how you wanna strike the floor ideally with, uh, with all your weight over your, your foot. Um, it should be a straight line. He's doing vertical forces, much vertical force as possible. And in the next image, we're going to see that small angle I was talking about that gives us that uh, forward motion, even though our vertical force is being produced in the ground. But you're still going to push forward because you're carrying momentum. Your hip will go uh, over your leg and create the small angle. So let's continue. Okay guys, uh, we're back and as I told you in the last video, I asked you, how come air resistance is very little and if you don't have negative friction, how come I cannot run 100 miles an hour? Why is it that these small forces prevent me from uh, taking advantage of all that propulsion I created before? Well. It's very simple. There's another force that in, it's influencing us, and it influences us every single day, every single second of the day. Which one is it? 
gravity. So running is not about horizontal forces, it's about vertical forces. And you'll be asking yourself, well, how come we're moving horizontally and you're telling me vertical force is the one that influences my speed? Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, you have to overcome gravity, because if not, you're going to collapse down. And B, to produce the horizontal movement, you strike the ground vertically, but your hip will move over your foot, right? I struck here, and now my hip is in front of my foot. This creates the forward propulsion, but the energy has to be vertical. All I have to worry about is to produce vertical force that will create uh, ground reaction forces, right? Uh, the greater the ground reaction forces I produce, the faster I will run. This is why uh, sometimes we get stronger, we start lifting a lot of weights, but our times don't, don't improve. Yes, you are stronger and you produce more force in the gym or against a bar but you're not producing more ground uh, reaction forces. You have to react like the third uh, law of Newton. It happens immediately. It's quick. It's not a slow, steady pickup of a bar. Okay? So, uh, the other thing is, uh, well, what's the, how come this happens? What's, what's the, well, I can explain this. What's the difference between a running and walking? When you walk, there's always a limb in the floor, right? There's always support. But when you're running, you're, you're in a flight phase. You're actually doing small little jumps, right? That accumulate uh, momentum and they reach top speed. So the problem with the little jump is that when you accelerate up, you have to accelerate down at the same speed with the same force. So uh, to answer the question, why can I run a hundred miles an hour, is one, because I have to overcome another force, which is gravity. And the second answer is, well, because as I get faster, the time, that window I have to produce force becomes smaller every step. So my ground rea reaction forces are related to the time I have to produce force. And how can I, uh, how can I prove this? Let's say, hey, I don't believe you, nothing. I, uh, I don't believe in physics, so uh, I need a, an empirical example. Well, get a treadmill, put it as fast as you can, tie yourself to it, and just start running. And you'll see that even though you have all the forward momentum created by the, by the treadmill, you cannot maintain the speed and you'll fall on your face, right? Don't do it actually. But you've seen a lot of videos like this. It's because I don't have the ability to produce great ground reaction, uh, great ground reaction forces. I don't have the ability to produce force in a short amount of time. Another example, and I do not want you to do this, I do not want you to do the other one either, but I mean, you can tie yourself to a vehicle and let it slowly accelerate. You will soon find out you cannot accelerate as fast as the car. Even though the car is producing all the horizontal momentum, uh, you cannot produce the vertical momentum to maintain your integrity and keep running and keep accelerating. So uh, we have to work on producing better uh, ground reaction forces and to produce force in the quicker time in a smaller amount of time and uh, that's why there's a lot of uh, training methods that shouldn't be used and others that are not being optimal for you guys right if you train producing slow strength all the time you won't have the ability to produce uh, quick forces and if you are always training on doing movements or producing ground reaction forces with two feet, you will never be able to produce the quickest ones that are with one foot, right? Uh, that's why I put this example. 
like the contact time on the ground for several activities. <clears throat> so you see walking an average takes 0.62 of a, sec of a second. A vertical jump will take 0.50. A plyo uh, falling from roughly, uh, it will be like 24 inches because it's 60 centimeters, more or less. Uh, 20 inches, something like that. Uh, it takes 0 0.20 to 0 0.40. Uh, a high jump takeoff, if you're a speed high jumper, it will be actually quicker. It'll be 0 0.14 to 0 0.20 of, of a second. But uh, just jogging takes 0 0.26. It's almost half the time of a, of a vertical jump, just jogging. Is, is quicker in the contraction in the ground. And running, let's say like a, like a competitive uh, endurance race, would take 0 0.20. This is the interesting thing. An average sprinter will take 0 0.14 of a second. It's much quicker than everything else except the competitive high jump. But in elite females, the ground contact time is in average 0 0.10. And in men, it's 0 0.08. But this is the fantastic part, and this is what's really interesting to me. There's a person that has been timed in 0 0.077, quicker than uh, the sprint elite athletes. And this person is a woman, is Flores Griffith Joyner. And she wasn't possibly stronger than the men that competed competed at elite levels, or she wasn't faster than the men that competed. She just mastered the ability, the skill of creating great ground reaction forces. She had the skill to have very short uh, ground contact times when she was sprinting. So that takes a very specific uh, neural adaptations and a very specific training. If she would have been training for slow contraction, let's say a vertical jump only, uh, a standing vertical jump only approach, she probably would not have been able to create these contact times. So uh, in the next section, uh, we will be talking about conclusions and myths about uh, sprinting. So here we can see a small chart with the ground, ground contact times of uh, several activities from the sprinting to uh, change of direction and the triangle on top. That's the 90 degree uh, cut or the full reversal of direction or a gradual turn and the depth jump and the block start push. So uh, you can see all of these uh, are um, important so you can determine which exercises you're going to choose and what area, which zone of contraction you're going to work the most depending on what you do. Uh, the second one, uh, you can see the ground contact times of uh, Carl Lewis and Ben Johnson and you can see what I'm talking about, about ha having a 0 0.08 uh, based on a tenth of a decimal uh, scale. This means this in seconds it's 0, 0 0.008, uh, but you can see Ben Johnson uh, was more consistent in that time and also he only had one step over uh, one, uh, 0.01 and Carl Lewis had two of them. Continuing with that, you can see the first and the second step for elite men and elite women at block clearance. Even though men uh, still have less ground contact time, you can average, of course, you can see uh, that uh, the tendency for men and women is the same. I mean, they have the, the practically the same uh, decrease in ground contact time. So that's always important to know that every step is going to be quicker, but also uh, it's going to be longer, but you, you don't have to artificially make it longer. So just for your information, we're going to get more charts like these in the future, in future videos. Okay, guys, this is the last part of the video, and we have the myths and the do's of uh, the conclusions of uh, what we've been analyzing. The first thing, no pawing.
No, that does not exist. We've concluded it's vertical force. You pulling on the ground is not vertical. You're trying to produce a horizontal force backwards in order to go forward. And that is not breaking gravity and it compromises your posture. Think about it. The more you paw, the more likely is that your trunk is going to go this way. And this is the way of doing a somersault. Great in gymnastics, not pretty good at sprinting. And the other thing is that if you paw, you're clawing to the ground, your biceps femoris, your hamstring, is in a very compromised position. And um, everybody says, oh, I, 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 uh, I tore my, my hamstring, I blew him, and uh, it's because he's not strong enough. In Latin America, that's, that's the explanation, and in parts of Europe. And the, the guy's legs are like this. <laughs> and they lift like 200 kilograms, like 400 pounds on the deadlift. And somehow his hamstrings are weak. It's not weak. You put them in a compromised position. You hyperextended them and flexed them. That is awful with all your body weight on the hamstring. So don't pop. Just strike the ground vertically, down, under your hip. That's it. Then, yes to posture. If I want to create the greatest vertical force or the quickest vertical force, I have to be vertical myself. If I have a poor posture and I break down when I hit the ground, I'm going to create more ground contact time. The risk of falling down is greater and if I just rotate forward, I'm creating more force forward and more rotation. This means I'm going to do a somersault, as I said before. And if I do bad posture and I put my shoulders back, I'm creating this friction vector like I explained before. The other one is no hyperextensions. Do not try to over push. You bounce on the floor. If you over push and hyperextend, first of all, you're losing your posture. Second of all, again, you're compromising your hamstring. And third, your ground contact time is longer. This means slower times. The other thing, stiffness. Yes, we do want stiffness. Not tension. We want stiffness. We want to be the comparison between a beach ball and uh, a gummy ball, you know, one of those rubber ones. A beach ball. Well, yeah, it falls and it sort of bounces, but it breaks its, its structure and then sort of lifts up. But the, the rubber one will bounce really quickly because it doesn't lose its structure that much. So we want to be like that. And our tendons have to be trained properly in order to do that. So you have to have proper posture, good tendons, very well trained, a good central nervous system, and your muscles must be ready to absorb that force. And that will produce stiffness, right? It's not tension, stiffness. I had a technical issue. We have low memory, so we gotta speed it up. So I'm gonna repeat it. Uh, we don't, do not want high ground contacts, right? We wanna modify our training to do, say, a really quick uh, ground contacts. Do not prioritize slow movements. Do not prioritize jogging and weight lift, slow weight lifting like we do in Latin America. Prioritize your sprinting, uh, your vertical jump standing versus your plyo. Probably your plyo is more priority, right? The other thing is uh, ground reaction forces. We want yes, ground rea reaction forces. That means you got to spend more time training in one leg because sprinting is one leg and also that means posture and balance because if you don't have good posture or good balance in one leg you're not going to be able to do it when you have a lot of momentum and some guy chasing you uh, and have the difference be very clear between the difference between momentum horizontal momentum and horizontal force we are long jumping if we're long jumping you're doing a lot of vertical forces a big one and you're gonna get measured horizontally. That's momentum that carries you horizontally, but it's not horizontal force. A standing broad jump or towing weight, that would be more horizontal force. 
So keep that in mind when you program and you train. The next lesson will be uh, 1.2. Uh, it was will be acceleration. We will uh, touch on that next time. It's pretty similar to this one, and then we're gonna go with training and other methods. See you there. And there you have it guys, this is the video, this is our first class, the second one will be uh, acceleration as I said in the video. And we're gonna uh, slowly but surely have more examples in planning, how could to design your session, and exercises that are, are effective for every single objective you have. Remember the, the thing is that you not all exercises are good and not all are bad. But you have to know what you're doing, what's your objective, what's you, what you want to obtain when you're doing every exercise. And that's what we're going to get to in the future. Also, you're going to know the difference between an elite sprinter and an, and an average sprinter. What's the difference technically and what's the difference in studies when they do studies on them. And it's probably not what you thought. And uh, we're going to have also... Um, more uh, videos designed uh, to, uh, let's say, um, design ex exercises for uh, runners or for people in team sports or things like that. And any questions are welcome in the comments. So see you later, guys. I hope you enjoyed it and bye-bye.